Welcome. Uh, it is the custom of this committee to swear all witnesses uh, who are to provide testimony. May I please ask you to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give to the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record indicate that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I'll offer uh, brief introductions of, of our next panel, and uh, then we'll have five minutes of testimony for each, from each of the witnesses. Ms. Nancy Kicek is the Associate Director for the Human Resources Policy Division for the Office of Personnel Management. In this position, Ms. Kicek leads the design, development, and implementation of innovative, flexible, merit-based human resource policies. Previously, Ms. Kicek served as the director of the Office of Actuaries at the Office of Personnel Management. Rear Admiral Thomas McGinnis currently serves as Chief Pharmaceutical Operations Directorate, responsible for pharmacy operations of the TRICARE management activity. He is a member of the Board of Advisors, uh, excuse me, a member of the Board of Advisory Associates of Rutgers College of Pharmacy, uh, Navy Mutual Aid Association, non-resident director, and the American Society on Health Systems Pharmacists. Mr. John Dickens is a director for health care issues at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, where he directs GAO's evaluations of private health insurance, long-term care quality, and financing and prescription drug pricing issues. He previously held analyst and assistant director positions with GAO's health care team. Uh, welcome to you all. Ms. Kichak, you now have five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lynch. Thank you for holding the hearing to discuss the oversight of prescription drug benefits within the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. The FEHB law provides OPM with authority to contract with private sector health plans that cover specified areas of health care, including prescription drugs. We currently contract with 111 health plans, which provide 269 plan options nationwide, from which retirees and employees may select the option that best meets their needs. The program is a $35 billion program, and drugs represent about 29% of claims. 
Like many private sector employers, the FEHB plans use pharmacy benefit management arrangements. To improve the administration of the drug benefits, OPM issued regulations in August 2003 that allowed the OPM Office of Inspector General to have full access to experience rated carriers' agreements with their pharmacy benefit managers. In 2005, OPM issued new contract requirements that included standards for FEHB carriers to use in contracts with vendors for retail and mail-order pharmacy. The carriers are required to use these standards, which provide for PBM transparency, integrity, and performance. Each year, we negotiate with individual carriers to design a prescription drug package that provides access to FDA-approved drugs placed in tiers based on clinical effectiveness and cost. Carriers also use pre-authorization to determine medical necessity for certain drugs and drug utilization reviews to check for excessive use, duplication, and frequency. Many carriers promote genetic generic drug awareness and dispense generic equivalents if available. Next, I would like to address the specific questions raised in your invitation to this hearing. You inquired about lack of transparency in the pricing of prescription drugs. First and foremost to OPM is providing information so that enrollees understand the benefits they are purchasing and the options they have. Therefore, many carriers provide drug transparency tools on their secure member websites. Through our regulations, our Office of the Inspector General has full access to the agreements our carriers have with PBMs. Whether increasing transparency alone will lead to lower pharmacy costs is unclear. In June 2008, the Congressional Budget Office found that more transparency did not necessarily lead to lower health care spending. You ask how prescription drug benefits provided in other government agencies such as Defense, VA, and HHS. Each of these federal agencies operates under its own statutory framework. TRICARE and VA directly deliver health care as a significant part of their service to their constituencies and have access to drug prices based on statutory authorities. You ask how prescription drug benefits are priced and delivered in the private sector. Private sector employers operate in competitive environments and many directly contract with PBMs to manage their drug programs and to process and pay prescription drug claims. PBMs also develop drug formularies, contract with pharmacies, and negotiate discounts and rebates with drug manufacturers. FEHB carriers rely on PBMs to manage drug cost and utilization for their enrolled population. OPM, in turn, negotiates with carriers on benefit design and program administration to encourage the efficient use of prescription drugs. You ask if OPM should consider alternative pricing and contracting methods for the FEHB program's drug benefits. The cost of drugs is of great concern to OPM as it is to private companies and other government purchasers. OPM is committed to studying all options that may improve the delivery of these benefits. We want the best and most affordable product and are looking for procedures that could be of assistance. We are exploring a broad range of options from improving our current contractual procedures to completely re redesigning how drug services can be delivered if our legislative framework is modified. Appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kuchak. Uh, Rear Admiral McGinnis, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the evolution. Rear Admiral, I'm not sure if your microphone is on. Can you hear me now? Not really. Can you hear me? Yeah, I guess you'll just have to keep the mic very close. Oh. We'll switch mics here. Okay. Is this better? Oh, much better, oh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, please hold it close to you, though. So yes, sir. That, that'll... Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the evolution of the Department of Defense TRICARE Pharmacy Program. Over the last 10 years, DOD has learned many lessons in the area of pharmacy benefit management. Prior to 2004, DOD's purchase care pharmacy benefit that's the retail and mail order portion uh, benefit, 
was carved into the five regional TRICARE managed care support contracts, which provided the TRICARE medical benefit. DOD determined that this type of carve-in, decentralized pharmacy benefit management structure, created significant challenges to the department, and it was clear that DOD needed to make some major changes for a number of reasons. First, a fragmented market share gave DOD less leverage with pharmaceutical manufacturers to negotiate favorable pricing in exchange for formulary placement. Second, the pharmacy benefit lacked portability across the regions, and the lack of standardization led to a non-uniformity of the benefit. And most importantly, actual expenditures and rebates received by its contractors for pharmaceuticals were not transparent to TRICARE. This structure also led to duplicative administrative services and fees, along with the inability to effectively plan and develop cost-saving measures. Moreover, federal discounts in the retail pharmacy venue were inaccessible because management of the benefit was not under direct DOD control. DOD, like many large U.S. employers, took action to carve out the pharmacy benefit from the managed care contracts and place it under DOD management using a single PBM. DOD now had the leverage it needed for very favorable pricing with the pharmaceutical industry for formulary management. DOD has implemented formulary decisions in 38 drug classes since 2005, representing over 50% of the fiscal year 2008 total DOD drug expenditures. Mr. Dickin of the GAO reported last year in April of 2008 that DOD avoided over $447 million in drug costs in fiscal year 2006 due to the formulary process and $916 million in fiscal year 2007. TRICARE also received an additional $60 million in rebates from the pharmaceutical industry in fiscal year 2007, making the savings to the U.S. taxpayer nearly $1 billion. The fiscal year 2007 drug costs of $6.5 billion accounted for 18% of DOD's total health care costs. Legislation passed in 2008 authorized DOD access to federal discounts for all covered drugs dispensed in its retail pharmacy network, bringing prices in the retail network more in line with what DOD pays for pharmaceuticals dispensed in its military treatment facilities and in the TRICARE mail order pharmacy program, which are some of the lowest prices available in the country. Today, TRICARE has virtually every community pharmacy in the country as a member of its retail network and experiences outstanding customer service based on a DOD quarterly survey of its beneficiaries. I want to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today about the TRICARE pharmacy program and how we continue to provide a world-class pharmacy benefit to active duty uniformed service members retirees, and dependents around the world. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Ticken, you now recognize for five minutes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today as you examine approaches to control rising drug spending within the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, which I will refer to as FEHBP. Prescription drug spending has been one of the fastest growing segments of health care spending in both the public and private sectors. Notably, prescription drug spending has been a significant contributor to FEHBP cost and premium growth. Projected increases in the cost of prescription drugs alone would have accounted for about a 3 to 5 percent annual increase in FEHBP premiums from 2002 through 2007. The Office of Personnel Management predicts that prescription drugs will continue to be a primary driver of program costs. 
Other federal programs also continue to face unsustainable increases in prescription drug spending and use varying approaches in an effort to control the spending. My remarks today, based on prior GAO work and updates from other congressional and federal sources, will describe the approach used by FEHBP to control prescription drug spending. I will also broadly summarize approaches used under Medicare, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, and Medicaid. As you have already heard today from other expert witnesses representing several of these federal programs, my comments will step back to describe at a higher level the general approaches these programs use in controlling drug spending. In short, the primary difference among these programs is that FEHBP and Medicare Part D rely on competition between health plans to control prescription drug spending, while VA, DOD, and Medicaid use other methods such as statutorily mandated prices or direct negotiations with drug suppliers. For FEHBP, competition aims to give plans an incentive to rein in prescription drug costs and to leverage their market share to obtain favorable prices. Like most private employer-sponsored health plans, most FEHBP plans contract with PBMs to help administer the prescription drug benefit. We have outlined key approaches that PBMs use in an effort to achieve savings for the health plans. These include, one, negotiating rebates with drug manufacturers and passing some of the savings to the plans, two, obtaining discounts from retail pharmacies and dispensing drugs at lower costs through their own mail order pharmacies, three, using such techniques as prior authorization and generic substitution to reduce utilization of certain drugs or substitute other less costly drugs, and four, developing and ma uh, managing formularies to encourage enrollees to pr use preferred drugs and to influence dr price negotiations with manufacturers. While OPM itself does not negotiate drug prices or discounts for FEHBP, it attempts to limit spending through annual premium and benefit, ne uh, benefit negotiations with plans, including the encouragement of spending controls such as benefit designs that provide incentives for increased use of generic drugs. Medicare Part D uses a model similar to the FEHBP by relying on competing health plans and their PBMs to control drug spending. In part, plan sponsors compete on their ability to negotiate prices and price concessions with drug manufacturers and with pharmacies. Even though the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is not involved in negotiations, plans are required to report price concessions to CMS to help determine the extent to which they are passed on to beneficiaries. In contrast, VA and DOD use statutorily mandated discounts as well as direct negotiations with drug suppliers to limit drug spending. They have access to a number of prices to consider when purchasing drugs, paying the lowest. These include the federal supply schedule prices that VA negotiates with drug manufacturers. These prices are intended to be no more than those manufacturers charge their most favored non-federal customers under comparable terms and conditions. Finally, Medicaid is subject to aggregate payment limits and drug payment guidelines set by CMS. Medicaid does not negotiate drug prices with manufacturers, but reimburses retail pharmacies for drugs dispensed to beneficiaries at set prices. An important element of controlling Medicaid drug spending is the Medicaid drug rebate program, under which drug manufacturers are required by law to provide rebates for certain drugs covered by Medicaid. Under the rebate program, States take advantage of prices manufacturers receive for drugs in the commercial market that reflect discounts and rebates negotiated by private payers. In addition, Medicaid, like each of the other programs I discussed, uses techniques such as prior authorization, generic substitution, utilization review, and cost-sharing requirements to limit drug spending. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Mr. Dickin. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Ms. Kuchak, in, in your testimony, admittedly, uh, you said that uh, transparency doesn't always result in lower prices. However, uh, for the Oversight Committee, or us, it, it's not an option. O you know, oversight cannot go forward without transparency. Mm -hmm. So it's, we don't have a, 
a choice of not having transparency, even if we didn't think the value of transparency, uh, you know, was, uh, was 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 something that we uh, uh, put a high value on. Let's say mm -hmm. it's just got to happen. We have to have it uh, statutorily right. and and through our congressional mm -hmm. mandate mm -hmm. is to have transparency. Well, we support transparency, which is why. Uh, it, with every suggestion or every time our inspector general makes suggestions to us, we consider them very carefully. And we have done two significant things, which I had in my opening statement, that we got from work when the inspector general came back to us and raised problems. One was uh, what we call the large provider contract regulations, which gives the inspector general full access to the full PBM contract. I understand that's now not digging down as far as they would like to go. Um, what what's, was described in the previous panel is an industry problem where the PBMs are not making their costs and their operations uh, public to anyone. It, it's not just an FEHB problem, but within the FEHB, we have given full access to the contracts that are available to our Inspector General. Plus Understood. Been, yeah. Understood. But the 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 uh, pharmacy benefit managers have made these uh, right. made this system so opaque and so complex that even when I sit an auditor right on right. there, have them go to work. These are professionals now. Right. They can't figure out what things cost and whether I'm getting a good deal or not. And we would and agree I, with you. I mean, right, I think right. Okay. Um, so so that's a problem. That's mm -hmm. a huge problem. We cannot operate that way. We have been up to now. We can't operate that way anymore. The administration is looking for savings, and we're trying to help the administration. And we think this is an area that is very fertile ground for savings. Uh, when we compare what TRICARE is paying, what others are paying, uh, and we, we look at the uh, discount, TRICARE up around 50%. Uh, VA up around 60, somewhere in that range. And then we look at uh, OPM getting about 12% with the FEHBP, Federal Employee Health Benefits Plan. Uh, that, that simply is not acceptable. Now, we need to, we need to dramatically change this. And uh, one, of, one of the, well, part of one solution would be to classify uh, PBMs as, as uh, subcontractors subject to the federal acquisition regulations. Now, that is not a simple system either. As someone who has spent far too many trips to Iraq and Afghanistan trying to figure out how we manage those contracts, those are not simple either, but they are a walk in the park compared to trying to figure out the system that we have now with the Federal uh, Employees Health Benefit Plan. This is really a convoluted, it's actually structured in a way and, and, and operated in a way that is meant to block oversight and block auditing. We cannot have that anymore. And, uh, you know, even the, the, the procedural limitations on the auditors, that they're not, be, not allowed to copy information, uh, that whole system is built on, uh, there's no competitive model in your competitive model. Uh, the, the system that's set up at the Federal uh, Employees Health Benefit Plan is, is basically uh, increased complexity to the degree that is, it is not understandable, uh, hide information from the consumer and from the auditors and from the United States Congress uh, Committee on Oversight, uh, basically deny information that would allow people to make that competitive decision on, on pricing and basically charge as much as you possibly can in that atmosphere and in that framework of, of, uh, uh, of uh, concealing information and, and making it so complex. That's the system we have right now, and we, we can't continue to operate that way. So what we think is, is one way to, to clarify this thing or, or give some clarity to it is to classify these folks as, as, as contractors. And at least we got a system, we put them in a system where we can keep score. 
uh, and, and we can figure out whether they're giving us a raw deal or not. Yeah. And, and as I understand it, uh, we can do that by executive order. We can do that by regulation right now at OPM. Is I, that something that you're open to? Uh, if we we believe that um, there there's definitely more information that should be available, but we do not believe that we have the regulatory authority to do that. We think that what we've done through regulation, see, OPM contracts with the health plans, and those with the health plans, the health plans contract with the PBMs. We are not direct contractors for the drug services. So we don't have the same authority we would if we were a direct contractor. In order to become a direct contractor with a PBM, it would require a, sta a statute change, in our opinion, not a regulation change. We believe that we will continue to explore it because we explore everything our Inspector General suggests to us. But we believe the regulation we change, changed, gave it, giving the Inspector General full access to the large provider contracts, meaning the PBM contracts, was the extent of the authority that we could do through regulation. So this is a question of law that needs further exploration because uh, we certainly believe in transparency, and uh, we would like to further that to the extent that we can. Well, I have to say that in trying to figure this whole system out, there is nothing more complex than what you got over there at the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program. This is really a, a very convoluted, you know, and I'm an attorney. I've done contract law. But you've got a system over there that is meant to deceive and, uh, and to keep the truth and information from getting to the public and to the, the beneficiaries. We don't even know what stuff costs. And so you may say you're for transparency, but... Take a good, hard look at that system, and uh, that that doesn't even have the beginnings of any transparency. Uh, and and I, you know, we're supposed to be trying to save money here. Well, we will. And and uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm I'm very disappointed to hear you say that, because you know we we think you do have the regulatory power. I will I will file legislation, uh, you know, to to have these folks classified as as subcontractors. I'm going to do that. I think you're making me work harder than I need to. I think you have that power already. But maybe my filing this legislation will, you know, light a fire onto somebody. Well, uh, we would be glad to get back to you with an explanation of what we think our, our authority is. Because if we have that authority, then we will not make you work harder than you have to. We will see what we can do to exercise that. God bless you. Okay. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, can I ask you, why do we have – now, look, you're, you're new over there. You've got to be new, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> – No, but, I, but why do we have, have – and this is probably a, a question beyond your own experience, but do you have any idea why we might have 256 contractors that we deal with? Because we have HMOs in, in most of the states in the nation. We only have about 13 government-wide plans – that, that service everybody, and even out of those 13, a, a certain segment of them, a very important segment of them are to just limited groups of people like foreign service officers or rural letter carriers. But we have HMOs in California and Florida and New York, et cetera, and they deliver care locally. Uh-huh. And there are only a handful of the larger ones that are, that are national? Are most of these are regional or local? Most or? of them are regional. Okay. Most of the, the, the big numbers come from the regional plans. Okay. And, again, the national plans open to everybody. I think it might be about seven, and then another, another five are to special groups. Okay. Now, you have 7.7 uh, 7 million, I, I gather, that are uh, within your, your group there. Right. Uh, let me turn to Rear Admiral McGinnis now. I think you have nine million, but you have seven million that are actually participating in your your pharmacy plan, and those folks are spread out all over as well, aren't they? That's correct, sir. They're all over the world. We have about nine point five million beneficiaries today, and, and about seven million use the pharmacy benefit. Now, in your testimony, you also described that you have a limited number of of, of contractors. Is that correct, or? Or did I mishear you? No, you're correct. Uh, we have one contractor currently that provides the retail pharmacy benefit for us. 
one contract that provides the mail order pharmacy benefit for us. It happens to be the same contractor, Express Scripts. We saw duplications yet in that, and beginning November 4th, there will only be one contractor providing both the retail and pharmacy benefit. How did you do the competition for that, for that, for that one contract? Uh, we used the federal acquisition regulations, uh, sir. We put out uh, our requirements, requests for proposals. They're submitted. We review them internally and award uh, that contract on many different uh, aspects. Past performance, we go out to uh, commercial clients who use this PBM and ask them, how are they doing for you? Right. And, and we take that into consideration when we award this contract. It's a one-year contract with four option years. Uh-huh. It's interesting, you know, you know, you have a situation where uh, you're using uh, one contractor, you're, you know, you sort of, I think, perhaps putting all your, your, your chips uh, on one bet, but you're getting a 50% discount or something of that magnitude, and when we dice it up, we're getting 12% uh, discount. I'm just wondering if there's a a proximate cause there, a, a direct relationship on that point. Mr. Dickin, you, you addressed that a little bit in your opening statement about the fact that there's there's two models here. Maybe it's maybe it's not maybe it is apples and oranges I'm comparing here, but um, what do you think? Well, I think certainly the, uh, the differences are in part because some of the prices that uh, Tricare are able to get are statutorily set, that they are able to choose the lowest of prices that are defined uh, by statute that set ceiling prices. Uh, those ceiling prices in, in, uh, in exchange are based on some of the best prices that are able to be negotiated uh, by non-federal payers. And so there's a certain guarantee of a level of prices that then TRICARE can negotiate uh, below if, if they're able to. Um, on the other hand, uh, FEHBP and its contracts with the multiple plans, those are individual contractual relationships where the plans and their PBMs will negotiate uh, on the behalf of each plan, and there's no guarantee in the way that there would be for TRICARE of a ceiling price. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I understand, uh, Ms. Kichek, uh, that OPM attempted to control drug spending in 2000 by introducing a pilot plan uh, with SAMBA. Do you, do you re recall that? Okay. Yes, I do. And now, I, I, I've been reading up on this, so I may be wrong on this, but as, as I understand it, SAMBA is the Special Agents Mutual Benefit Association? Or some Correct. Sort of Mostly FBI agents and Secret Service agents. Just a few thousand people at the time? Yes. Okay. And my understanding is that you try to do a pilot program that it will, would allow the special agents and their families, this few thousand beneficiaries, to purchase their drugs off of the federal supply schedule. That's correct. Okay. And, and if, if, again, I'm correct, uh, at, at the threat of that uh, pilot program, we had three drug companies, uh, ref big ones, refuse to participate and supply drugs to that program. Uh, I can't attest to the exact number, but that is what happened. It was a concern of the drug industry. Uh, we, were we were trying to um, try a new approach and get yeah. better discounts. It was a concern of the drug industry that if that was the nose under the tent and we were going to move 8 million people onto those federal supply schedules with those major discounts, the pharmaceutical companies – would not be able to sustain the discounts they had promised to a big group, but more limited than ours. And uh, they opposed it and said that they would not honor their contract on the federal supply schedule if we went forward. And we were forced uh, to, to withdraw that proposal. Wow. Uh, the, men, the menu or the, I guess, the formulary. The formulary that would have been available to the special agents, was that a, a, a full formulary uh, of uh, uh, proprietary drugs as well as generics? That was, that was the full spectrum of drugs on the supply schedule, yes. I'm just wondering why we didn't call their bluff um, in terms of um, their refusal to supply those drugs. 
Um, it seems like a sort of a brash and uh, mm -hmm. a confrontational way to deal with the problem. It was definitely a very uh, stressful situation because, of course, our responsibility is to make sure, and we take this very seriously, that federal employees have access to health care. And every year they re, re, uh, they have the option to select new, but we wanted to have that plan in place and coverage continuing. And the manager of the federal supply schedule at that time, VA, was very concerned that this pilot was jeopardizing care to other members of the VA or other federal uh, purchasers from that schedule and really asked us to withdraw the pilot. I think that we pushed it very, very hard. It delayed our getting ready for open season and negotiating rates and benefits because we had to get somebody else to, uh, I mean, we had open season on time, but we at some point had a point at which we had to enter into a contract with Samba to go forward with these coverages or they would not have been in the program in the following year. And so we chose to withdraw the pilot. Okay, now, and, and I, I I understand that you don't under, you don't remember how many companies was were involved. I don't. Uh, I'm just from my readings, it was uh, three big ones, mm -hmm. uh, three larger uh, pharmaceutical companies. Now, I'm just wondering if you remember uh, what percentage of the drugs on the formulary would have been affected by these three companies or four companies. However, um, in terms of the the program going forward? Uh, Ninety percent. Ninety percent. So the they were three large companies. Okay, I, yeah. I have yeah, confirmed. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, just trying to replay that in, in my mind. Uh, I know it was, uh, yeah, it was Pfizer, Park Davis, and Merck. That's the information I have. Uh, I'm just wondering if a similar pilot program would work if we just use generics. That way, if, you, if something's generic, out, it's out there, it's not subject to, to patent control. Uh, mm -hmm. And you get a lot of, uh, if you have real competition, and you get a lot of people that can produce that drug at a reasonable cost, uh, do you think a pilot program just focusing on generics where three big players can't come in and say, mm -hmm. you know, embargo this uh, Right. Deal. Well, let me say, as, as we've said before, this is a very complex program, uh, and drugs are very complex, you know, retail, mail order, generic, Tell me about brand, it. et cetera. Um, and so I'm uncomfortable, but I'm going to take a stab at it anyway. Okay. Where you really need to save your money in drugs is on the non-generic. The d generic are really, uh, in, in my opinion and my experience, pretty low priced anyway. All right. And to make it worthwhile, I think you'd have to go for the brand. That's a great point. It's a great point. Now, thank you. Uh, uh, Admiral McGinnis, the, um, the success that you've had over there um, at, at uh, TRICARE, um, has there been any attempt to expand beyond your existing population or uh, – no, you know, we've only covered uh, members of the seven uniformed services. Uh, we've not uh, been asked to look any further than that. Uh, we've expanded the benefit to virtually every pharmacy in the country uh, yeah. today. Okay. Uh, In the testimony earlier uh, today, uh, Ms. Kichak, uh, we heard from uh, Mr. McFarland that um, the transparency and the data for them to make determination was, was not available. Um, and yet, you say there's been a, a new effort to, to do just that, uh, to free that up. There seems to be a, a little bit of... Uh, uh, difference in your, your your views and Mr. McFarland's views, the Inspector General, in terms of the access to the information, the transparency uh, of the organizations themselves. Do you know what might 
cause that difference of opinion? I think what's happening here is what we're uh, at one point when uh, one of our plans subcontracted with a PBM, the subcontract was not available for audit. So now that that is the actual subcontract, um, that's definitely improvement. What I believe that our Office of Inspector General would like and find very helpful and what all the previous panels asked for was more basic, how much profit, where's the money going, the, the whole underworkings within the drug companies. That doesn't become a part of the contract or the subcontract, and that is not yet available. And as I was saying before, I'm not sure, and I promised to get you an answer, that we have the authority through our regulatory process to demand that kind of information. But, but I will find out. But I think it's a difference between, at one point, the contract wasn't even available. Now the contract is fully available, but the underlying workings are still not, have not been opened up. In the same manner that all the previous witnesses said, the drug companies do not make this, this information available. Okay. Let me, let me jump back. Uh, we talked about, well, my idea originally was to look at the generics, you know, because I saw that problem you had with the SAMBA program. Right. Is there any appetite, I know the earlier incident was in 2000, is there any appetite at OPM to look at another pilot program where we might uh, expand the, the uh, access to the federal supply schedule uh, for, for others? Or well, as you know, at OPM we have, we have a new director who is taking a top-down look at everything. We have a new focus on data-driven uh, analysis, which is also looking at that stuff, and we are looking at every health plan with a fresh look. Now, um, the new administration got here, by the time they got here, we were already engaged in negotiations for 2010 because the process starts early. Uh, but that is certainly something. We have an appetite right now for looking at everything. We are, are bottom up delving into whether these uh, schedules are the right way to go, whether we should carve out drugs, everything is on the table, how much data we can get from our carriers is also on the table. So we are taking a fresh look, and I would say, therefore, there's an app. We are definitely going to consider that along with many other options. Okay. You know, one of the other things, when I read through that, that case uh, of the, the SAMBA plan, it, uh, it puzzled me. Now, under the statutory uh, and, and regulatory guidance, uh, these health carriers, these, these carriers should not um, be receiving any uh, financial benefit from uh, the carved out uh, uh, pharmacy plans. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's supposed to work. Now, why do you think we have such opposition from the carriers when we try to introduce, if there's no financial benefit, why all the, why all the, the opposition? Well, uh, change is difficult for everybody, first of all. Secondly, administratively, uh, particularly in this day and age where we're trying to do so many um, health care programs where wellness programs, um, that's the wrong word, but case management programs, for example, diabetes, where you're trying to track uh, prescription drug, the usage of the right drugs with health care outcomes, and we're pushing our plans to do things like that. I think that that is an incentive or one of the reasons why the plans want to be able to have access to that data. I think the other thing they're trying to do is in a competitive environment, they think they can come up with the best design. And we do have different designs. We have people today that are, are waiving the co-pays on generic drugs to try to get people to switch. We have other people, other plans that get you in generic drugs by a, a plan manager who looks at that. We have plans that are trying to be more cost effective through e-prescribing and getting, getting you to generic that way or trying to get you to the most effective drug that way. So I think the plans are trying to uh, use the drugs as part of their health care, care initiatives, and that's one of the reasons for the okay. resistance. Fair enough. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Dickin, I have not bothered you that much. Let me, uh, let me sh shift to you. Has uh, GAO encountered any difficulty other, in, in other instances obtaining access to data, as we had uh, described uh, to, with Ms. Ms. Kichak, um, in, in trying to fulfill its role in, in assuring that uh, federal, the federal government does not overpay for prescription drugs? Yeah, I'd be glad to describe GAO's experience. I think the panelists um, in the first panel uh, well describe the, uh, the challenges that oversight agencies have uh, in transparency in this area. Um, GAO in 2003 did examine the experience of FEHBP plans, uh, three uh, FEHBP plans with their PBMs, um, and we were able to look at uh, particular contracts or financial reports that were specific uh, to those FEHBP plans and their uh, PBMs. I'd like to make a distinction, though, that, that while we were able to look at that, and I think that was much of the issue that um, Ms. Kichek was talking about for the, what's being made available to uh, the inspectors general, uh, there's a, a much larger book of business that the PBMs have where FEHBP is a significant uh, part, but not the entire part. And that affects their contracts more broadly with manufacturers and with pharmacies. And so while we were able to look at the information specific to FEHBP, uh, uh, we, we did not obtain information for that broader book of business that could affect things like the prices they're acquiring for mail order drugs um, or the total rebates they're getting on their entire book of business, not just those allocated to FEHBP. Let me d drill down a little bit on that. What information, I mean, you had a chance to review the, uh, you know, pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, in your analysis or attempted analysis, what information uh, was there that you, you did not have access to that you think might have been helpful in uh, judging their, their uh, effectiveness? Well, I think, I think uh, the distinction really is we, we were able to look at what's specific to the FHBB book of business, but not, uh, not information that was broader across uh, their entire book of business that would then affect uh, rebates they may be getting that would include, for example, their FHBP lives, as well as all their commercial lives that that, that PBM uh, would be negotiating with manufacturers on, on their behalf. So that was considered proprietary, the relationships they had with, in other words, these re rebates that they are, you know, call them what you may, these other financial incentives that they were getting, uh, those arrangements were not subject to your review. If, if they were not rebates specifically dedicated to FEHBP, so we were able to look at what rebates the, the PBMs promised to pass on uh, to the FEHBP plans, um, but that they may also begin rebates that are much broader uh, for their entire book of business, and that's the part that we, uh, we did not obtain. Okay. Uh, but... FEHBP, you have 7.7 .7 million people. So, well, I, I guess you can't assume that, uh, you know, any, any percent of the volume of their business is, is uh, dedicated. But uh, it would be nice to get that information to find out their full, you know, their full uh, menu of revenue sources and find out whether or not, uh, whether or not, the employees, the members of the FVHBP are getting the benefit of some of those, uh, some of those rebates. Uh, as I did earlier with the previous panel, I'm going to ask you, you know, obviously I didn't, I didn't exhaust the entire uh, landscape of issues that, that we could have addressed, but, and, and again, I'm going to allow other members who are not in attendance to ask you questions in writing, and I'd appreciate your cooperation in answering those if they do, they do come. Um, why don't we start with Mr. Dickens, since we've been down at Mr. Kichak's end, Ms. Kichak's end uh, for the most of the hearing. Uh, take two minutes if there are issues that we did not hit on here uh, that you think are important. Uh, we'd like to hear about them. Well, I think the hearing has as well addressed some of the challenges that um, uh, that oversight faces within the context of, of um, FEHBP and the plans contracts with, with PBMs. I, I guess I would just note that this is not an issue that's unique uh, to FEHBP. Um, I can speak to uh, GEO's experience also, for example, with Medicare Part D. Uh, that's an area where we've been working since 2007 
the, in that case, uh, uh, plans are required uh, to report price concessions or rebates they may get to CMS. Um, however, uh, CMS and HHS have interpreted the legislation that created Medicare Part D is not allowing to disclose that to GAO. Uh, GAO has been working with committees, including this committee, uh, for legislative clarification that GAO indeed would have access uh, to that information for Medicare Part D. Uh, in fact, is that a legislative fix or is that a regulatory fix? It's a legislative – well, uh, because there's uh, – uh, uh, HHS has interpreted the legislation. We're seeking legislative clarification that GAO does have access under its broad authority. Is there a bill out there right now that gives you that access? There is a bill, uh, H.R. 2646. Well, who's sponsoring that? Pardon me? Who's the sponsor? Um, I, I can get back to you on that. Okay. We'll, we'll figure out. I thought you might know. Okay. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt, but please go ahead. I, I think that's why I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. Rear Admiral McGinnis. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, transparency is probably the most important thing on both sides. Uh, our PBM must pass through all rebates benefits. They're not able to even negotiate rebates. Uh, everything's a pass-through to the government. We negotiate the rebates with the pharmaceutical company. Everything on our side also has to be transparent. We put our formulary on the open web. Everybody can see our formulary. Uh, our formulary committee minutes are put up on the web. We have a beneficiary advisory panel advising us on that formulary, bringing things to our attention to consider before we make changes to that formulary. Uh, we have good feedback uh, from that beneficiary organization. We incentivize our PBM properly so that they come back consistently with a 95 percent or better beneficiary satisfaction rating to get the monetary incentives that we put in our contract. And we feel that these type of things uh, work very well for us. The formulary uh, placement of medications has brought us uh, great results with the pharmaceutical industry. They've will been willing to give us much better pricing than the federal ceiling price for that formulary placement. Very good. Thank you, Admiral. And thank you for your service to our country. Ms. Kichak, two minutes, yeah. please. We're, we're very concerned about uh, drug costs because they're 30% of our program. And we want to know everything we can about drug costs so that we can find the best way to, to deliver them and the most cost-efficient way to serve the federal employees and retirees. We are working with our federal partners. We're working with TRICARE to understand their system. We're exploring all options, including options we've tried before and didn't fail. We're willing to look again. And we are responding as quickly as we can to suggestions to make more information available to our inspector general. So we're going to keep working on this problem until uh, we make it better in some fashion or another. Thank you, Ms. Kichak. I want to thank you all for your willingness to come before the committee and, and help us with our work. Uh, and, and you can tell Inspector, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you can tell Director Berry that we appreciate uh, the participation and cooperation of OPM as well. Now, thank thank you. you all, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.